Order, order. Andrew Bridgen to move the motion. Andrew. Uh, thank you, Sir Gary, and it's always a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship. I would like to th start by thanking the Backbench uh, Business Committee for scheduling this debate and to the 17 colleagues from across the House who supported this application for a debate on the trends on excess deaths, following on from my adjournment debate on the 20th of October on the same issue. Uh, Sir Gary, the, uh, the eyes of history are upon us. Every generation looks back in wonder at the incredible mistakes of our forebears. They will ask questions such as how could they possibly realise how, how, how wrong they were? What on earth happened to them? Why did they ignore the evidence for so long, their values and every opportunity to learn from the mistakes of yesteryear? What madness captures men? From 2010 to 2019, annual death rates in England and Wales oscillated between 484,000 and 542,000. In 2020, there were 607,000 deaths, 65,000 more than the maximum in 2018. In 2021, there were 586,000, which is 44,000 more than the 2018 figure. After such a rise, there should be a deficit, a significant deficit. In fact, because sadly, our most vulnerable and elderly, who might have lived a while longer, were taken from us early. Mm -hmm. But in 2022, there were 577,000 deaths in England and Wales, and in 2023, 581,000. A huge rise, when in fact, a significant de deficit would and should be expected. The deficit, and then some, has been filled not with the extremely old and the extremely vulnerable, but with others, many, many others, who were often young or in the prime of their lives. You might want to ascribe the excess deaths in 2022 and 2023 to the virus, but that would be a mistake. That's not what their death certificates say, and moreover, there are far too many young people dying. Far from being below the recent polling, uh, rolling average, Excess deaths in 2022 have been above, 6% above, in fact. In 2023, when one might expect deaths to finally fall below the average, the excess has also been 6% above. These numbers are higher in the younger age groups. No one with integrity can fail to be troubled by these figures. What actually is going on? And that's what we need this debate for Today. It's a problem that affects us all. It affects every community in every constituency across the country. And uh, I would like to thank all the honourable and right honourable members who've attended this debate today. And I think we need to thank the public for their interest, which has stirred the interest of colleagues. And I'm very encouraged by the turnout for today's debate, which is considerably better than we've seen in the past. Not everyone in this room will be comfortable with analysing scientific data and figures. Um, that is not my position. I was fortunate enough to um, have, take a degree from Nottingham University in Biological Sciences many years ago, and I specialised in biochemistry, genetics, behaviour and virology. I, I'll give one on that. Yeah. Okay, it's a very important debate he's having. So in 2022, that we saw nearly as many excess deaths across the UK as during the Blitz. And in my own region of Yorkshire, every single year since the pandemic, we have had excess deaths. And my constituents are very concerned by this, but what they're also concerned about is almost a deafening silence from the NHS about what is causing this, why it's happening, and what they're doing to alleviate this. So I thank the Honourable Gentleman for bringing this very important debate today. And only by talking about it can we actually get to the root cause of what the issue is, because there clearly is an issue. Well, that's the whole point of a representative democracy. We're here to raise the issues on behalf of our constituents and to look after their best interests at all time. I thank the Honourable Gentleman for his attendance, but we had enough signatures for a three-hour debate in the main chamber. We were actually giving a 90-minute debate in, in Westminster Hall, which I did mention to the chair of the Backbench Business Committee. I felt was a bit of an insult, given the gravity of the issue we're debating, uh, to those who've uh, lost loved ones over the last few years. And I'd also like to... Th yeah. I'll give way. I'm extremely uh, grateful to him for giving me... And he's right to point there is considerable concern about this issue. And due to that concern, does he agree with me that we should be using 
uh, the most accurate data available, and using the data set of the age standardised mortality rates, which takes into consideration growing population and an ageing population. Of course, um, we, we should be using the most accurate figures that we've got. And I, later on in the speech, near the end, I'll be talking about the data that we really want, which could settle this matter once and for all uh, beyond reasonable doubt. So I thank the public for their pressure and their interest in these statistics. And I thank the people who've attended today in person and the thousands and thousands who'll be watching on the television or, or online. There is a burning question Sir Gary, at the heart of this debate. It is, after excess deaths, there should be a deficit. Where is that expected deficit? When will we have it? And worse, why is the deficit not being filled but significantly exceeded? And why are the institutions, whose job it is to notice these matters, to record these matters, to publicise and call attention to these matters, why are they all apparently asleep at the wheel? And the second burning question, which I'll come to first, is why is no one listening to those raising the alarm? The research and analysis of two of Britain's most trusted doctors provides us with alarming clarity. Only this week, Sir Gary, the director of the Centre of Evidence-Based Medicine at the University of Oxford, Professor Carl Hennigan, reviewed, reviewed the causes of excess deaths and concludes that they are predominantly related to cardiovascular disease. He told the Sunday Express newspaper, this cannot be explained by COVID, population growth or an ageing population. Consultant cardiologist Dr. Asim Malhotra, who is a world-leading expert in the causes of heart disease, also told TNT Radio yesterday that even though cardiovascular disease is multifactorial, the top of the list for, in the hierarchy of causes behind excess cardiac-related deaths has to be the experimental COVID mRNA vaccine until proven otherwise. And this is not speculative. No. I won't give away at this, but let me just finish this trial and I'll give way to the honourable gentleman. This is not speculative, but based on the highest level of data which combines plausible biological mechanism, randomised controlled trials, high quality observational data, pharmacovigilance data, autopsy data and clinical data. And those who choose not to acknowledge these cold, hard facts, cold, hard facts, Mr. Sagari, are either unaware of the evidence willfully blind or lack a conscience. I'll give way to the Honourable Gentleman. I'm very grateful to the member for giving way and I'm grateful for him, uh, shining a spotlight on this important debate about excess deaths. But I'm just keen to understand the difference between co correlation and causation because there's a correlation between eating ice cream and sunburn but we don't necessarily assume the two are together. Yeah. It could be sunny weather. The same goes for this case. Is it to do with the fact it's lockdown? Is it to do with late presentation, access to the NHS? These are the key bits to try and understand the causation and correlation to understand why these numbers are so high. I agree with the honourable gentleman. He is a medical doctor, so he does have some knowledge, clearly. Uh, but to correlation is not causation. But correlation is an alarm bell, Sir Gary. And alarm bells are going off all over the building, but no one wants to open the door and see if there's a, there's, a, there's a fire. I believe that future generations will ridicule us for what we've just done in response to a seasonal airborne virus. We apparently lost our collective minds. We've imposed a brand new type of quarantine on a healthy population. In breach of all public, uh, previous public health advice, in breach of our own carefully crafted expert pandemic plan, in breach of flagrant breach, of the sensible and experienced advice from many professionals. Those noble dissenters are being vindicated one by one, inevitably so, as the suppressed, shaming, real-world evidence finally emerges. I'm not going to mention those who harass and discredit and ridicule the dissenters. They, they loudly paraded their egotistical virtue on social media, in the press and on television. But I know exactly uh, what harassment feels like. And we inflicted social distancing, masking, and school closures on healthy children at no risk from the virus. We did this to protect adults at the expense of our children and their social and mental health. People raised alarm, Sir Gary, but nobody listened. A society that consciously and knowingly sacrifices perfectly healthy children for adults is sick in itself. Our time, this time, will not be an era that's looked on well by future generations. That is going to be our legacy. And I call on this House and those in authority to right 
this grievous wrong and right it quickly. With unbearable cruelty, we isolated even those who would gladly have made the individual choice to see their grandchildren. And worst of all, we bypassed all the procedures, all the protocols, and all the science to inflict on a healthy population a brand new and untested product that had never before been used outside clinical trials, never mind approved. There was no long-term safety data. The safety analysis in the trials was eight weeks, and, and then the control group was vaccinated. No age stratification for recipients of an, uh, an experimental medication for an illness with an average mortality age of 82. No liability under any circumstances for the manufacturers of these experimental treatments. Furthermore, there were good reasons, based on the science known at the time, why these products might be harmful. Ridiculous future generations may come to loathe us. We will be forever be the poster boys and girls of a society that collectively lost its mind and lost its moral compass. They will hang this millstone around our necks for eternity. And what's the flaw in this human nature that latches on to things and destroys all before it? It's been dubbed by some as the madness of crowds or a kind of mass formation psychosis. The sort of thing that allowed China to commit population Armageddon with a one-child policy for decades. The sort of thing that... Uh, allowed us to have millions, millions of cattle slaughtered during uh, the apparent foot and mouth outbreak where we were persuaded, not by the science, but by plausible patter of provable idiots like Professor Neil Ferguson. Yes, the very same. His advice led to the bankruptcy, the immiserization and the utter despair of countless farmers forced to destroy their own livelihoods in a futile attempt to prevent the spread of an airborne virus, a virus that had already managed to pass in the air all the way from France to the Isle of Wight. So how many times must the so-called experts be caught literally with their pants down as their models fail yet again? How long must we be subjected to debunked dribble being dumped in our political discourse? How long must decision makers deal with discredited modelling and moribund and captured institutions? And why will no one listen to reason when they've been proven wrong so many times? And there are plenty of other examples in medicine, from bloodletting with leeches to pointless lobotomies to not washing hands between the mortar and the labour ward. Doctors and scientists are far from immune to groupthink, and the current batch are living proof. I, I'll give way on that point. Uh, to the Honourable General. And this will not be the first, or I suspect the last government in history, not to follow the evidence when it comes to uh, difficulty. But when governments make uh, mistakes and protect themselves and don't uh, look at the evidence, we as a democratic society should expect there to be an inquiry that establishes uh, what has happened and what should have happened and what should happen in the future. Does the honourable gentleman agree with me that the inquiry that we have set up is failing in its task in doing uh, that job, and it is assuming that lockdown was right from the, the beginning. <coughs> I, thank, I thank the right honourable gentleman for that intervention, and I agree with him wholeheartedly. This is not a, a political issue. This is a public health uh, issue that should affect every constituency in the House. I think we know that the so-called COVID inquiry is, uh, has, has already set itself out, the answers it wants to get to. It, it has all the appearance of a whitewash, and clearly <clears throat> it was deeply disappointing this week when they announced that the, the module to do with the safety and efficacy of the vaccines has been put off indefinitely, certainly until after the next general election, which is extremely disappointing. And, and another instance uh, I could talk about is, is that I contacted every public and media body I could think of in 2014 to tell them again and again that the sub-postmasters were innocent. But no one listened. And I knew that sub-postmasters in my constituency were completely honest. Anybody who knew these pillars of society knew it. The innocent were falsely accused of dishonesty over the Horizon scandal, and they were relentlessly pursued by a merciless, mendacious and malicious bureaucracy. And it's the coldness that shocks most, Sir Gary, the imperious arrogance, the mercilessness that captures institutions and cowards in authority when a single narrative closes our collective minds to nuance, to experience, 
to the inconvenient truths. No one listened to the sub-postmasters. No one cared. No one, in, no one in power moved a muscle to help. But now, all of a sudden, one media program has shifted the narrative to reveal that the experts were wrong, that our institutions were wrong, that those in authority were wrong, and that an infallible computer system was in fact fallible. Even our justice system got it so tragically wrong with thousands of court hearings and judges making wrong judgments. Will the post office lessons be learned regarding the COVID insanity? So who's actually dying now? Well, it's not the old and frail, as it was with COVID. In fact, the deaths from dementia, a key benchmark of elderly deaths, have been in deficit ever since COVID, as we would expect after a period of uh, high mortality. Instead, particularly for cardiovascular deaths, there's been an incessant week-on-week -week excess mortality for months and months in the young and middle-aged. Every age group's affected, but the 50 to 64-year-old age group has had it worse, and I'll declare an interest. Um, there has been, <laughs> they have been stricken with 12% more deaths than usual in 2022, 13% in 2023, and at least five out of six of those deaths this year have nothing to do with COVID whatsoever. My constituent, Stephen Miller, was a healthy IT engineer in his 40s. He had two doses of AstraZeneca jabs in the summer of 2021 and was ill very shortly afterwards. His side effects were so bad that he lost his job. And in November 2021, he was rushed into hospital and he now has cardiomyopathy and has ventricular failure with a maximum of five years to live, taking him to 2026, unless he has a heart transplant. And when I saw him last, he had a, a resting heart rate of 145 beats per minute. He subsequently has lost his partner and access to his child and is at risk of losing his house. He now has a diagnosis from Glenfield Hospital in Leicester of vaccine-induced cardiomyopathy. And I will help him to try and get the compensation. But he's just one example of one of my constituents who's probably going to have 30 years of his life stolen off him. His child will lose his father. How is £120,000 of compensation possibly adequate for that? And I certainly will. I'm most grateful to my honourable friend for introducing this debate so coherently. But would he be able to explain why Module 4 of the public inquiry into the safety of these vaccines has been arbitrarily postponed from next July. Surely the case he mentions highlights the need for urgent inquiry into this. Um, my honourable friend is absolutely right to raise, raise that issue. Why would they put any investigation uh, at the public inquiry, which I think is costing some hundreds of millions of pounds and should be there for the public interest, uh, put that debate back in indefinitely? Um, I fear there has been political pressure placed on the inquiry. Clearly, there's a, a lot of political capital uh, in the run-up to the next election has been placed on the fact that the government and support from the opposition parties did the right thing in our uh, pandemic response, including the rollout of the vaccines. I think that the very fact that they've done this indicates that there is something to hide, and it should make the public extremely suspicious, and I'll be coming on to that shortly. Um, for two years, we turned society upside down so as not to, quote, unquote, kill granny. Now that mum and dad are dying, uh, it appears that no one cares. This is Alice in Wonderland thinking. People in their 50s and 60s, I declare an interest again, normally have more, uh, many more years of active contribution, I hope so, and deeply fulfilling lives left to live, and these are the people being hit the hardest. Furthermore, the raw number of lives lost is not the only measure we can look at. We, we have better methods. The most famous method is known as quality adjusted life years. Those who understand public health generally refer to these as qualies. Qualies measure healthy years of life lost and are the most sensible metric for properly assessing the impacts of deaths on lost life, on families and on society. Qualies were ignored at the outset. They were ignored in July 2020 when the government's own assessment was that lockdowns would reduce qualies by about, by about a million years. 
the UK, a million years. They were ignored when deciding to inject the young with experimental vaccines, despite the refusal of the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation to recommend jabbing under 15s in September 2021. Even at the COVID inquiry, when the Prime Minister tried to raise the issue of quality adjusted life years, he was shouted down by Hugo Keith, King's Counsel. The lead lawyer at the COVID inquiry, he then revealed his unbelievable, unforgivable, his negligence and his ignorance by saying, I don't want to get into life, uh, quality life assurance models. This, I repeat, is the most senior lawyer at the so-called COVID inquiry. So when I say future generations will ridicule us, it's not hard to see reasons why. The pandemic, a term which some of our best academics from around the globe questioned from the outset in published and peer-reviewed papers, is over. The crisis has passed, yet still empty vessels continue to drown out intelligent, reasoned, expert discourse. Not knowing what a quali means is one thing, but parading his ignorance with arrogant disdain ought to disqualify Mr Keith from any further part in that inquiry. And sadly, his condescending disdain for open inquiry epitomises what many of us have encountered time and time again when raising these issues. We've seen a smorgasbord of fanciful excuses proffered for the rise in heart attacks. Sir Chris Whitty laughably claimed that it was a reduction in statin prescriptions even though prescribing levels were exactly the same. Mm. And it would take years, or even decades, for changes on that issue to take effect and be seen in population mortality data. The media have tried to persuade us, persuade the people, that eating eggs, or the wrong kind of breakfast, or climate change is to blame. So Gary, people are sick of being patronised with these lies. Some have claimed the excess deaths are due to COVID. The litter is littered with studies claiming that COVID causes heart disease. Almost all include COVID cases from spring 2020. It was almost impossible to be tested and become an official case unless you were sick and in hospital. So Gary, proving that sick people get heart disease more than healthy people does not mean that COVID causes heart disease. Indeed, the claims can be easily debunked. Cardiac deaths have seen a steep rise in both Australia and Singapore, as well as the UK. And these countries did not have any significant COVID until 2022, but they did roll out the jabs exactly the same time as we did in the UK. Correlation does not prove causation. We've already heard it in this debate. But correlation with and without COVID can rule out causation. The excess cardiac deaths were certainly not caused by COVID. Some have claimed that the excess deaths were caused by lockdowns. Well, it's well known that psychological stress increases the risk of heart disease. The government subjected people to a massive propaganda campaign of fear, well documented by Laura Dodsworth in her book, State of Fear. We were cut off from our usual support networks. For many, we saw immense financial pressures. Such policies could contribute to heart disease in a minor way. However, the sharpest rise came later entirely coincident with the jab rollout. So we have a clear temporal link between increased deaths and vaccination. And some have claimed that the excess can't be down to the jabs because Sweden have uh, not had as many excess deaths as elsewhere, despite having a very similar number of doses per million of the experimental vaccines. But it's important to understand that heart disease is a cumulative risk. In the UK, we already have a serious problem with heart disease before the pandemic. And it's just got much worse uh, following the vaccine rollout. And by contrast, Sweden has the longest healthy life expectancy in Europe. It's no wonder that they are a statistical outlier on excess deaths now. If you're under 50 and you live in Sweden, the chances of dying from heart disease are already half that of uh, a resident of the UK of the same age. Some have admitted to the problem, but claimed it was worth it. Science journalist Tom Chivers even said regarding jabbing children, it sounds cruel, but a small number of, of deaths would be worth it. As I pointed out earlier, from China through to the UK, any culture willing to openly sacrifice children for adults is rotten in my view to its very core. And look what's happening now. Yes, again, we're seeing a peak in COVID hospitalizations. We should be ex when we, 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 as we should be expecting from a coronavirus in January. The number of people infected and the number of intensive care admissions was about the same every six months before and after the vaccinations. The number of COVID intensive care admissions 
in the January to June of 2020 wave was about the same as the July to December 2020 COVID wave and remains similar in the January to June 2021 COVID wave and the July to December 2021 COVID wave. The jab therefore had no impact whatsoever. And those interested may wish to consult a recent paper in the Journal of Clinical Medicine that demonstrates exactly this point. And the next important factor is, is that Omicron is far less deadly. The reason there are fewer COVID deaths now is because Omicron's arrival at the beginning of 2022. But viral waves will continue to come and go until almost everyone has post-infection immunity. And we're not there yet. It's clear that viral waves were not impacted by lockdowns. It's increasingly clear they were not impacted by the jabs either. People have denied that the viral waves peak naturally at predictable times of year. But how much longer can that be denied? The lockdowns did not cause deaths to decline from their peaks in April 2020 because they also peaked and fell in April 2022 and March 2023 without lockdowns. Indeed, in 2020, infections were already falling before the lockdowns were even started. The actual problem with excess deaths started in spring 2021 with the jab rollout. And there was a stepwise rise in ambulance calls for life-threatening emergencies at exactly the same times. Hospitals started to be overwhelmed also for the first time. And the number of people unable to work because of long-term sickness started to rise. Even mayday calls from aircraft rose. Are we meant to think that this is all a coincidence? When are we actually? We know that these injections cause a range of serious adverse events, especially cardiac events. Now, the excess deaths are the tip of this very ugly iceberg. And we haven't even mentioned the world-shaking scandal of jabbing people who'd already had COVID, which, at a stroke, almost entirely demolishes the credibility of our public health policies at this period. We completely immune, uh, uh, ignored natural immunity. That one fact ought to be a red flag of gigantic proportions, but no one's listening. And I haven't got time to discuss the fact that jab was, was not pulled when it became clear that an incredible one in 800 doses administered led to serious adverse events and consequences. The rotavirus vaccine was pulled entirely after causing an adverse event rate of one in 10,000. For the 2009 swine flu vaccine, it was an adverse event of one in 35,000 that were harmed, and it was then pulled off the market. The COVID jab is still being pushed, and it's seriously harming people. Inevitably, at a rate much higher than one in 800, because most people are being exposed to multiple doses of the vaccine with the, uh, the same risk, adverse event risk, at each dose. Thalidomide, syphilis treatment, all these infamous, appalling, shattering medical scandals are dwarfed by under the iceberg under the water that is the medical scandal we're currently living through, the experimental COVID-19 so-called vaccines. And it took 11 years after the drug was withdrawn in 1961 for thalidomide scandal was first raised in Parliament. 11 years after the thalidomide scandal, before the word thalidomide could even be mentioned in the Chamber of the House of Commons. Well, Sir Gary, I'm not going to let that happen this time. That's why I fought so hard to raise this issue in Parliament at a cost of my reputation, my career, and the financial security of my family. The public inquiry should be urgently looking at this issue. Instead, they're wasting taxpayers' money accessing over WhatsApp messages while people are dying. As if that isn't bad enough, I've already shared with you, the, uh, we learnt this week that the vaccine module has been postponed indefinitely for no good reason. It's as if the inquiry is so desperate not to find fault that they can't even look at what's happened with the vaccines. We need transparency. Dr. Claire Cray, co-chair of the Heart Group, has been doggedly pursuing the UK Health Security Agency for their record level data on dosage, dates and deaths for a year. This is the data that could sort out this issue once and for all. They admit they've got it. The MHRA admit that all this data has been released to Pfizer, AstraZeneca and Moderna. Yet they claim they cannot anonymise it for public release to the public. A failure to release this data makes it look like there is definitely something to hide. A recent poll in the USA shows that more than half of the public think the vaccines are responsible for a significant number of deaths. If there was nothing to hide, they would certainly release this data for analysis, anonymized, to stop the upswell of legitimate concern. The latest response from the Information Commissioner's office is that Dr. Claire Cray's got to wait another six months at least 
before a case officer will be assigned to this issue. This is not acceptable, Sir Gary. They've released our health data to Big Pharma, but they won't release it to us. The record data level data must be released. It is really too much to ask. Is it really too much to ask that the British public be given the same level of access to the relevant data given to Big Pharma companies, those actually responsible for this debacle? Corporations that carefully secured immunity from all legal liability, or in this country, indemnity from the government before dangerously and negligently experimenting on the health of our nation and the world. We're witnesses to the greatest medical scandal in living memory, the consequential fallout in trust, public opinion, and public confidence uh, is only just beginning. Continued attempts to shut down debate, flatten dissent, and obstruct independent analysis can, can only delay the eventual collective shame. It's going to be a reckoning, and we're going to have to try and rebuild trust in our health services, in our media, and in our politics. And uh, we haven't even started on, on that journey. So, Gary, before I was expelled from the Conservative Party for voicing my concerns over these experimental vaccines and the harms that I believe they've called, I met with a senior member of the party who, after listening to my concerns about the vaccines and uh, NG163, the midazolam and morphine scandal, told me quite calmly, Andrew, there is currently no political appetite for your views on the vaccines. There may well be in 20 years' time, and you're probably going to be proven right. But in the meantime, you need to bear in mind, you're taking on the most powerful vested interest in the world with all the personal risk for you that that will entail. So, Gary, I refuse to bow to that threat. And as they say, the rest is history. People have alleged that I'm spouting conspiracy theories. Well, I, I think it is a conspiracy. It's a conspiracy against the science. It's a conspiracy of silence. And, Sir Gary, it's a conspiracy against the people. And I will have none of it. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, the question is that this House has considered trends in excess deaths. Colleagues, um, over nine of you wish to be called. Wind-ups will begin at 10.38. So I'm going to ask you to speak. I'll, I'll impose a voluntary time limit of three minutes each. I'm going to try and get everybody in if I possibly can. Sir George Howarth. Thank you. Sir Gary, the honourable gentleman, I'm afraid, is basing his arguments on evidence that is highly controversial and strongly contested as to its reliability. I will shortly explain what I mean by that assertion. I did attend two meetings which the Honourable Gentleman shared on this issue, the latter of which, late last year, included a panel of, in inverted commas, experts, um, who made presentations. I attended both of those meetings on the basis that I, I am aware that there are cases in which some people with underlying or pre-existing medical conditions were vaccinated inappropriately, and in some cases with lethal consequences. And I do support the case for some form of restitution uh, for them and their surviving families. At the second meeting, Sir Gary, um, which the Honourable Gentleman shared, which I referred to a moment ago, I was alarmed that um, some of the um, evidence given was polemical rather than scientific. Um, the nature of some of the expert presentations um, caused my alarm specifically um, to be concerned about the misleading and inaccurate um, assertions by, for example, Andrew Wakefield on the MMR scandal, which uh, made the link, or tried to make the link, um, between uh, the vaccination and autism, and was thoroughly discredited subsequently. But the consequence of that, uh, and it's still being felt, is that children aren't being vaccinated and there is now an upturn 
in the uh, incidence of measles in some cases um, have with serious consequences. The meeting I attended, uh, and I already referred to, involved a number of, again in inverted commas, experts who gave presentations which included data which I am frankly sceptical about. So I undertook at that meeting to raise my concerns at the data's accuracy with the Office of National Statistics, and I have done so. In a response from Professor Sir Ian Diamond, the national statistician, he has undertaken to, and I quote from his letter, his reply, consider and investigate any possible misrepresentation of the data. And I'm grateful to Sir Ian for that undertaking. In a report in the Times today, um, reference is made to a study published in The Lancet that, and I quote, missed COVID vaccines are to blame for 7,000 deaths. That's missed COVID vaccines. 7,000 deaths and hospitalizations. The, I, I'll be, I'm coming to a, drawing to a close. So the, the, this, uh, and by the way, this evidence involved, I think, 64 million people. Now, the, right, the honorable gentleman quotes some research that he refers to based on data which is not um, reliable. This is a major undertaking published in the Lancet and it completely um, makes the opposite point to that of the honorable gentleman. Speech as short as I possibly can. Um, and I congratulate the member for North West Leicestershire for raising this issue and for his determination to, um, to highlight the challenges that we're facing. Um, on the one hand, we might have expected that the pandemic would shorten the lives of a number of our more frail citizens and thus expect a fall in deaths post pandemic. And we did see this, actually. The ONS reported 608, roughly, thousand deaths in England and Wales in 2020. 586,000 in 2021 and 577,000 in 22. But this was higher than 2019 when there were 531-ish. So that does warrant further inspection. We do expect a fluctuation year on year and we also expect the total number of deaths to increase year on year as the population increases and ages. We therefore look at the five-year average and currently we're using 17, 18, 19, 21 and 22 because of the um, outliers in 2020. But even then, it's unlikely we'll be exactly average, and we'd expect some years to be higher and lower. The ONS monthly mortality analysis shows that in 2022, there were 32,000 more deaths than the five-year average, and in January to July 2023, there were 21,809 more. This equates to an annualised figure of around 37,000, but the figures appear to stop in, January, in July 2023. Please could the Minister advise why the data series has been discontinued, because it would be helpful if it were not. But these are raw numbers, and we must be cautious, because as the population ages and increases, of course, so will the number of deaths. And the ONS therefore used the ASMR, the Age Standard Mortality Rate, which has fluctuated month to month, but is actually down for both 2022 and 2023, when compared with the five-year average. So, overall, when adjusted for age and population size, the number of deaths is not excessive to that which we would expect. But we need to look further at the trends on age and the causes of death to see a fuller picture. Others will speak, no doubt, of rising cardiovascular disease in men and a late presentation of cancers on the, uh, or the rise in liver disease. But as a consultant paediatrician, I'd like to focus on children. The Child Mortality Database, National Child Mortality Database, collates data regarding children's deaths from 0 to 18. Their latest bulletin from March 23 shows there were sadly 3,743 child deaths to the end of March 23, which is an increase of 8% on the previous year. So could the Minister con comment on her investiga or investigation she's doing into the cause of this increased mortality and what's being done to prevent further deaths? The purpose of CDOP is to investigate these deaths, but the average investigation is taking 392 days, with less than half completed in 12 months and a significant fall in the number being completed in 12 months. You can ask what she's doing to improve this uh, process. Um, one particularly distressing feature of child death data is that suicidal deliberate self-harm was the primary cause of death 
between children of between 10 and 17 years. Looking for the data, it's getting um, much worse within children 10, 10 to 14. I understand the government's aware of these figures and is investing in mental health for children and improving online safety, but we'd be grateful if the Minister could elaborate further on the steps they're taking to support children and prevent further tragedies. One of the reasons I get exasperated... Sorry, I'm finishing this. One of the reasons I get exasperated with the COVID inquiry is there seems too much focus on who said what to whom, did someone swear, did the actors like each other? I'm not that interested. I want to know what lessons can be learned. Was lockdown useful? Is getting children out of school useful? Was the vaccine a suitable thing to give children or not, particularly if they'd had uh, COVID before? These thank are the you. answers that we need. <clears throat> Mr Neil Hanvey. Uh, thank you, Sir Gary. I'm as uh, tight and practical in the chase, if that's OK. So I, I want to start by paying tribute to uh, the Honourable Gentleman from North West Leicestershire for his courage and determination on this important matter. Uh, and I also want to challenge uh, the uh, Honourable Member for Nos Nosley uh, on his assertion that they were so-called experts at that meeting. They are world-renowned experts in their field. That is just a matter of observable fact. This morning I want to focus on the safe use of novel mRNA agents and concerns over their alleged role driving excess deaths. I should repeat at the outset a point that I have made previously in this place and directly with the Minister that any agent has the potential to cause harm or injury to the subject. For the avoidance of doubt, the position that I have taken is based on decades of involvement in the management and delivery of clinical trials. Uh, politicians who dismiss these data and emerging clinical evidence are acting in a wholly irresponsible manner and pose a very real threat to the duties of honesty and candour at the heart of good clinical practice. If substantiated, these concerns surfacing around falsified or concealed data are the most serious I can imagine. Yes, I'll give way. I wonder he's defending the experts. Has he actually checked up the backgrounds and has he checked out the, um, the criticisms that have come to them and the fact that in some cases they've had their medical practitioner um, status withdrawn? Um, I, I'm not going to get into the detail of that. I've got far too short a period of time and too many important points to make. But I have worked in the same institution as Professor Dalgleish, and his credentials are impeccable. Um, politicians who dismiss these data uh, and evidence are acting, as I say, in a, in a responsible manner. This is necessary because these are the standards on which good clinical practice is based. Good clinical practice, or GCP, is not about a nice bedside manner and knowing what treatment to prescribe. It's a set of institution, uh, internationally recognised ethical and scientific requirements that must be followed when designing, conducting, recording and reporting on clinical trials that involve people and have their origin in the Declaration of Helsinki. The rights, safety and well-being of uh, trial subjects are the most important consideration and should prevail over interests of science and society, including commercial or political interests. So uh, I will uh, conclude with um, this reflection on uh, that important uh, uh, principle. The, uh, in the foundation of good clinical practice is under threat. In their December 2023 pathology research and practice paper on gene-based COVID-19 vaccines, Rodeza and Pari gave the following warning. Pandemic management requires societal coordination, global orchestration, respect for human rights and defence of ethical principles. Yet some approaches to the COVID-19 pandemic, driven by socio-economic, corporate and political interests, have undermined key pillar pillars of ethical medical science. None of these clinical experts are quacks or conspiracy theorists. As the government said so often during the pandemic, we must follow the science. Philip Davies. Three minutes, colleagues. Three minutes. Uh, as we've seen in data published by the ONS, non-COVID excess deaths continue to run higher than they should. People are dying unexpectedly across all age groups, particularly, it seems, at home. Since restrictions in March 2020, there have been 111,000 excess deaths in people's own homes. And in the week ending 22nd of December 2023, deaths at home were 11% higher than the five-year average. 
In the first 11 months of 2023, over 21,000 excess deaths took place at home, roughly one every 25 minutes. Just last month, an article in The Lancet, co-authored by the Head of Mortality Analysis at the ONS, stated that while the causes of these excess deaths are likely to be multiple, ONS data did show some clear trends. In particular, the largest relative excess of death since the pandemic occurred in young and middle-aged adults, with cardiac deaths happening outside of hospitals the most elevated. In other words, young and previously healthy people are dying at home from cardiac-related events, and we don't know why. They go on to con conclude that timely and granular an analyses are needed to inform prevention and disease management efforts. But let's be clear, this is not a new phenomenon. Experts have been raising concerns on excess death as early as 2021. I remember seeing an interview with Professor Carl Hennigan, the Professor of Evidence-Based Medicine at Oxford University, where he called for an investigation into the 75,000 excess deaths at home between the period of March 2020 and October 2021. 90% of these excess deaths were not COVID-related, but were things like diabetes, heart disease and also cancer. Many of these deaths could have been prevented had people not been dissuaded from seeking care because all they were told everywhere by the media, by the government, was stay at home, protect the NHS. Or maybe they had tried to get help, but were dismissed by a health service only concerned with one disease. Those calls for an investigation went ignored then, just as they are ignored now. Perhaps the COVID inquiry, as others have said, should make better use of Professor Hennigan's time by asking him about this topic, rather than the tittle-tattle they seem to revel in. The pertinent question is, why did we lock down at all? And this is really what I uh, think is the biggest damage. Uh, time's of the essence, uh, Sir Gary. So uh, I want to finish just by saying, look, we can all speculate on the cause of this excess death, which are clearly happening, from withdrawal of health care during lockdown, the increased risk of sedentary lifestyle and alcohol consumption, the impact of the pandemic and related restrictions on NHS staffing levels, increase in NHS waiting times, lack of access to emergency care, the COVID-19 vaccine adverse reactions, or some other unknown cause. A mix of all of the above, perhaps. But until the government commits to a robust and independent investigation, we just won't know for sure, and the speculation will keep going, and that's why the government need this investigation rapidly. Thank you. Graham Morris. Serving your chairmanship, Sir Gary, and I would like to congratulate the Honourable Member for North West Leicestershire in securing this debate. It's important Parliament considers this and uh, all of the evidence available. Um, as, you, as you might expect, Sir Gary, I, I'm uh, going to have to declare an interest. I'm Vice Chair of the All Party Group for Radiotherapy, a supporter of Action Radiotherapy, and an advocate for the Catch Up with Cancer campaign. The, the two issues I'm going to uh, um, stress or, or, or highlight are, are um, delayed access to cancer treatment and health inequalities. The, inequ the inequitable access and the availability of radiotherapy services is leaving the UK lagging behind other countries in relation to, to cancer outcomes. This was true before the pandemic, amplified by the consequences of, of delayed diagnosis and treatment caused by the uh, by the pandemic. I, I, I hope the Minister will be well versed in the arguments, but I'm always very happy to meet if it would be helpful to advance the cause of the campaign and, uh, and to promote the idea of, of accessing this uh, effective and cost-effective life-saving treatment. There's no doubt COVID-19 impacted routine access to healthcare, but it's little comfort to those protected from COVID due to cancellations and delays to routine services and treatment, if for them the outcome is delayed cancer diagnosis with the inevitable impact on prognosis and delayed treatment. I don't agree uh, always with uh, my, my honourable fr friend, uh, um, the member for North West uh, Leicestershire, but I think never again can the whole NHS be subverted to a single illness or condition, no matter what challenges we face. And cancer, as has been highlighted by other members, is not the only uh, um, condition affected in this way. I, I, I want to say something about health inequalities in the little time that I've got left, because this is, it's really an important issue. Um, 
I hope the Minister is aware of a recent report by Professor Peter Goldblatt of University College London entitled Health Inequalities Cut Life Short. But the report considered life expectancy of people across England and Wales. And it's quite clear those in the poorest areas suffer the worst health inequalities. The economic inequalities affect health outcomes and my constituency is on the front line of health inequalities. We have the worst rate of COPD in the UK, highest levels of obesity, third highest rates of epilepsy. We are well above the national average for diabetes, heart failure, depression and dementia. For me, this is a political solution. The Honourable Member said, this isn't a political issue, it's a public health issue. Public health is a political issue. As in 1997, I expect that in 2024, it will once again fall to a Labour government to begin the process of fixing the years of Tory neglect and mismanagement for my constituents, the communities of East Durham. The general election can't come quick enough. Kate. Uh, thank you, Mr Chairman. And I think it's clear that there is far more demand uh, to speak in this debate than there is time. Uh, yeah, so I will, yeah, of course, yeah. be brief. But I think it does show uh, that we absolutely need a longer de debate. We need a debate on the floor of the House uh, it's not just members in this room who want to speak, but members of the public have shown uh, enormous interest. I don't want to go over the excellent points that have already been made, uh, the data that's already been shared. We know we have a problem with excess deaths in this country, particularly amongst younger people, particularly cardiovascular disease. And that in itself uh, is, a, is a huge challenge. And we need medical experts, we need statisticians to address those issues. Uh, I'm not qualified to do so. What I will say is this, lockdown changed everything. Our response to COVID changed everything. And just as we look back on different periods of history, before the war, before the Industrial Revolution, I think in future we will look back before and after lockdown. Uh, lockdown's changed our economy. It's changed how we relate to each other. It's changed our health. It's changed our understanding of children's development. Uh, but the conditions under which those decisions were made, decisions which were overwhelmingly wrong, in my opinion, though I absolutely do not blame any individuals for, given the pressure they were under, but the conditions under which those decisions were made have not changed. The conditions under which we uh, suspended the precautionary principle, where we ignored the fact that the interventions may cause more harm. We suspended the importance of children's education. We suspended safeguarding children. We suspended, uh, suspended the need for medical trials. We suspended all sorts of safeguards that have stood society in good stead uh, for a long time and the conditions in government and in the media and in wider society under which those decisions were made have not changed because unfortunately yet we have not got to the heart of the matter of why the why the pressure came from the media why we had to follow what other countries were doing why we obsessed with minor with particular points of data like deaths from COVID rather than considering the wider impacts on society. And my concern about the COVID inquiry is asking all the wrong questions. It's, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. concerned with who swore at who on WhatsApp and not the wider conditions around wh why these decisions was ma were made. And I remember as a mother at the time when um, the former, former, former Secretary of State for Education, several education secretaries ago, stood up in the House of Commons and said that he would close schools. And I remember shouting at the television, don't do it, don't do it, because I could see the impact that it would have, not just on my own children, but on all the wider components of society. Society is like a big machine. You can't just take out one part and assume that the rest will continue to operate. We have seen that clearly over the last three years. We must address the reasons that the decisions were made. We can't do that in three minutes each. We must have a longer debate. Thank you. Jim Shannon, three minutes, colleagues. Thank you, um, Guy, and first, uh, for giving me a chance to speak. Can I also, first of all, thank the Honourable Member for North West Leicestershire for, for setting the scene. The issue is clearly a sensitive one, and I've come from the angle of someone who is fully vaccinated and wanted to be and, and accepted that and who believed in the process. But I'm also one who advocated for those who did not want to take the vaccine and whose freedoms were being curtailed. And this is a strange balance for me, perhaps, and others uh, to strike, and yet I was firm in that stance. I also find myself in a delicate position as I listen to the Honourable Member, as I do believe that there are questions to be answered. And with all due respect to the Minister, and who I respect greatly, and the Honourable Lady knows that, despite the Honourable Member's various attempts and differing methods of approach, the questions have not been answered to the Honourable Member's satisfaction in any of these approaches, and I know that there are many in my constituency with similar questions. I lost my mother-in-law to COVID. Uh, so guy, it was well publicised two and a half years ago. I miss her every day. I also lost uh, other loved ones to the complications of this disease. And I've seen more who are living with the long-term effects of COVID and can understand the drive for a vaccine. 
and also understand that to achieve this vaccine, that there were emergency legislations enacted. This House uh, and Government happily allowed these to take place as our medical professionals had deemed it to be necessary. Happy to you. Member for giving me, I would agree with me that what I think what needs to be focused upon now is what was said earlier by the, by the Labour member that never again must society and government be all consuming dealing with one particular public health aspect almost to the total exclusion of others. Um, I thank the, my honourable friend and colleague for that intervention. I do agree with that. Uh, I don't understand, Sir Gary, why the supposed links between donors and PPE provision are worthy of investigation, and yet excess deaths have been demonstrably linked to vaccines have not been deemed as important enough for investigation. Yeah. There is, to me, a question to be answered. Yeah. It seems a natural follow-on that the unprecedented steps taken would hold to the scrutiny of an investigation, which is seemingly supported by medical evidence. I'm not a doctor, Sir Gary. I don't profess to be, uh, but the facts and man the manner raised by my colleague do call for scrutiny, and therefore I find myself supporting these calls for an investigation. I've seen young men in my constituency struck down with unexplained cardiomyopathy before coming and seen the heartache that the families deal with as they wonder why. I know there are many families at this time with similar questions, and they are wondering, uh, and it could well be that the increase has nothing to do with the vaccine, but I also believe that we must look into why fit yeah. young men or fit non-smoking healthy weight women in their 50s are having heart attacks, and their consultants ask them, which injection did you take? These are the signals to me, as an unlearned man, that there are questions to be asked. Mm. And I do believe that there is an onus on our government and our minister with great respect to see that the questions raised by medical professionals and voiced by members of this House are taken seriously and addressed. Not for one second do I claim to see the correlation, but enough people have warned it. And therefore, I support the calls for investigation yep. and ask for the right. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. The, the voice of Como, Derek Thomas. Thank you. This year for securing this debate and for his effort to get it to this table, to this House. Now, I've received a significant number of emails, and the consistent theme across them all is the lack of trust. And trust is key. Um, and they have a right to know that elected representatives take them seriously and work to get answers and find out why these excess, excess deaths are occurring. And every death, Sir Gary Streeter, is a tragedy. In each home, uh, there's a devastation. And we see this in each of our constituencies. I've sat with several families who have lost loved ones and are not satisfied with the answers they are given. We owe it to them to work to restore trust and be transparent about why, deaths, why death rates are higher than expected. And ignoring the issue will only increase this anxiety and distress further. People deserve answers to know why these numbers are high. What was the cause? Could deaths be avoided and who and what is responsible? We all know people who have died no one can realistically deny that deaths are higher than expected. Too many families are left without the answers. But what is the cause? This is what needs to be established. Are these deaths attributed to COVID? Is it the vaccine? Is it misdiagnosis? Is it lack of access to treatment? Is it constituents choosing to stay at home? I've got two examples. One lady who had cancer was, seemed completely clear of it and then chose not to go back uh, to get checked up and died quite quickly after that. Another gentleman had... Um, had a severe lung problem and he was denied the drugs because of gaps in the assessment of the degradation of his lungs and died at 56 years old very horribly and very quickly. As has already been said, a deafening silence will not reassure our constituents, will not ensure, the way, ensure that we learn and respond effectively in future health pandemics. Whatever the... Yeah, so, so. Around the cancer issue, operations were cancelled, treatments delayed, and more and more stories are becoming uh, to the fore around vaccinations of cancer patients and how that triggered other complications and uh, caused deaths. Would you agree with me that more needs done to investigate this? Uh, thank you for that intervention. That was really what I was coming on to. Uh, so, whatever the minister is minded to say today, a proper understanding of um, is needed to understand what is behind these excess death, the examples that have just been said. And in this country, Sir Gary, we seem incapable of talking openly about death. It will come to all of us, but we're incapable. We lack the courage to openly discuss the subject. And the consequences are widespread. And to address in an open and transparent way can only be helpful in our, in our effort to bring healing and some comfort to our grieving families. Thank you, Sir Gary. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sir Gary, and I'm here because a number of my constituents who I work for as my employers have asked me to be here 
And I would um, congratulate the Honourable Member for North West Leicestershire on having this debate. He's right to ask the questions, and he's right also that the post office, post office rising scandal has taught us that asking hard questions is really important. Um, this is a country which generally does hard science well. I'm very proud of that. I don't think it's uh, immodest to say we are a science and technology uh, superpower. That always needs to be evidence-based. We need to be unafraid to ask difficult questions and never, ever lack suffi sufficient professional curiosity to really challenge and interpret the data. And uh, I, 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 that is really important for um, all of us. We had reference to lockdowns. We, I don't think we'll ever, I don't think the Parliament will ever agree to lockdowns again because the situation is completely different now. We now have testing, we now have vaccines, and we now have medicines. So I cannot ever see a future Parliament agreeing to lockdowns again. I am one of the 93.6% who freely chose to be vaccinated. Um, that was my choice. I support people who did not choose to be vaccinated but it is worth just mentioning that 93.6% figure, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to have been uh, vaccinated. Just looking at the facts, and I, I don't have a biotechnology degree as the Honourable Gentleman does, but the, the, what, I have, uh, uh, what has been put to me is that according to the Office of National Statistics, which is independent, um, the mortality rate in 2022 in England was significantly lower than it had been in 2020 before the introduction of COVID-19, an analysis also from the ONS published in August last year shows that people who've had a COVID-19 vaccine has a lower mortality rate than those who haven't been vaccinated. Now, I, I, I accept there are other data sets. Um, I completely agree with the Honourable Gentleman. If there is more information that should be in the public domain, I support him. But I do also support the Independent Office of National Statistics, and I think we, we challenge it at our peril because it is important for politicians that we have reliable data that's genuinely um, independent. Um, it, I, I'm afraid I'm not going to, just because I have so little time and I don't want to knock others out. So the facts are, what is the NHS doing about uh, the, 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 you know, people who are uh, dying who shouldn't be? And we know that is from cancer, cardiovascular disease, stroke, diabetes, respiratory disease, dementia, musculoskeletal conditions, because people stayed away uh, from their GPs or hospitals for too long. And, you know, to be fair to the government, there is a major programme. We want 9 million more additional treatments and diagnostic procedures over these, uh, this year and uh, the, the year we just had. 30% more elective activity, £8 billion extra put in um, by the Chancellor, and a big focus on pharmacy. And I think also a focus as well on diet, exercise, lifestyle and air quality, all of which are issues which are important. Tom McCartney. Thank you, Sir Gary, and uh, as ever, it's always a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship, and I am, as ever, grateful to the Honourable Member for North West Leicestershire for moving the motion and leading this debate. I, like many Honourable Members, have been concerned by the increasing trends in excess deaths in recent years. This includes the male population, where there has been a higher number of excess deaths than there is for women. Notwithstanding that point, all excess deaths are, of course, a tragedy. According to the Government, from the start of the pandemic until the 1st of December 2023, there were 77,907 excess female deaths and 92,913 excess male deaths, the latter making up 54% of the total. But there are deeper differences once you delve into the data. The excess deaths total for women between the ages of 25 and 64 are 12,579, and for men, the figure is 24,688. So nigh on twice the number of working age men have died unexpectedly since the pandemic than working women. Yet, where is the research looking at the underlying causes for these excess male deaths in conditions such as those affecting the heart, diabetes and urinary disease? Where are the reports saying that we de what we need to do to address these issues as a whole and as a particular nuances of these figures? Who is looking into how this can be? In government, which minister? Which department? Which corner of our expansive NHS? Which think tank? Which select committee in this end of the estate or in the other place? The myriad of external health and well-being orientated bodies, be they quangos, NGOs, charities, etc., have a plethora of experts who are available across the state and the various institutions we have in this country. But for some reason, maybe one that centres around an, an uncomfortable truth maybe, no one who should be interested in the huge rise in excess death rate increases seems very interested at all. So is it a scandal? Perhaps time will tell. But silence from the Secretary of State and her minister speaks volumes, as does the silence from the Department for Health and Social Care civil servants. Silence from the Office of Health Improvements and Disparities is similarly underwhelming. Silence from the health community at large is echoed by silence from the Royal Colleges. Silence from Chris, Sir Chris Whitty and his colleagues. 
It is just not that we all know that if the gender figures were the other way around, there would be huge publicity and research. It is the fact that these figures, in general, are purposely being ignored, it seems. Is it because men in this age group are more affected? Do men not count as much? Overall, we have this huge number of excess deaths from COVID. We do not know what the underlying causes are for a range of conditions. It is as if the health authorities and government do not want to talk about it. Have they something to hide? Do they know something we do not know? Back in the dark days of the pandemic, there was a debate in the chamber regarding vaccinating, perhaps mandatorily, young people. Only two opposition members turned up to support the government minister at the time. Over 40 of our government colleagues did not support the government's approach, and my speech that day centred on the phrase that with regard to the health of our youngest in society, we should do no harm. Similarly, I'm not sure ignoring the higher incidence of excess deaths is a policy I'm proud of this government following. And I do hope that the Minister will be announcing some investigations and work to ascertain why the ultimate harm of excess death numbers is rising and how it might be tackled generally for both women and men of all ages. As an aside, ensuring all schools now have defibrillators Fun and that the government recently achieved this is commendable, in my mind, raises more questions than providing more, any answers. So is this the next post office horizon type scandal? Time will tell. The truth will, one suspects, eventually out. Thank Dean you. Russell, but please sit down at 10.38. Dean Russell. Th thank you, Chair, and, uh, th and I pay tribute to uh, the member for North West Leicestershire for securing this debate. I will be very brief, and I have a very specific point to make. Um, as we would all agree, losing a loved one can be a profoundly painful experience. And in Hertfordshire, families are currently experiencing delays from the coroner due to the apparent increase in complicated deaths over a number of years. Whilst it's right to take time to do a full investigation, I'm concerned that the lack of communication with families and loved ones um, to update them on the reasons for the delays or what the timings would be means that I'm getting inquiries which, from families who are suffering, uh, just not knowing what's happening, why the delays are happening, and it's feeding uh, concerns. So would the Minister please agree uh, that this only uh, adds to the pain of families uh, and the pain that they're experiencing? And they just want answers. They just want to know what's happening. So uh, would she um, please urge coroners to at least, if they're not able to do the, the work they're doing, to at least ensure the communication is there, the regular communication and updates to make sure families know what's happening and to reduce the suffering they're already going through through grieving. Thank you. Thank you. We're now turn to our front benches. And can the minister please make sure she gives the mover of the motion at least two minutes to respond. We'll turn to the, uh, the opposition spokesman, Abina Van Kassari. It's a pleasure, as always, to serve under your chairship, Sir Gary. I can congratulate the Honourable Member for West Leicester, Sir, for securing this important debate on trends in excess mortality. And I also want to congratulate Honourable Members who have spoken today in this lively debate. Oops. SS deaths refer to the difference between the actual registered number of deaths and expected deaths based on data for previous years. And I'm sure that we agree that recording and understanding these trends should be an important symbol for any government of this country, because it's only through these lens that we can not only discover any growing areas of irregular activity, but we can also use it to tackle these issues to improve the lives of our families, constituents, and everyone in this country. Like honorable members have mentioned today, it's sad that the SS deaths do appear to be increasing in recent years. Whilst there's, an estimates, whilst there's a range of estimates from different bodies in calculating the SAT figures, all the estimates point towards a similar increase in trend. In fact, life expectancy in the UK has also fallen to its lowest level in a decade, with male life expectancy down from 38 weeks from its pre-pandemic peak and female life expectancy down to 23 weeks. These are worrying trends and reinforces the need for us to understand what is happening and what we can do to turn these trends around. However, I think it's first important to tackle the issues raised by the Honourable Member for North West Leicester regarding his claim of causation between COVID-19 vaccines and excess deaths in this country. The opposition, I'm afraid we're limited on time, the opposition has stated clearly before, and I will confirm again, that we believe vaccines are the most effective public health intervention, either in relation to coronavirus or health in general. It is clear through extensive independent research 
that COVID-19 vaccines have been and continue to be extremely successful at preventing deaths. While there have been some extremely rare cases of people sadly suffering side effects with possible links to the vaccine, the data does not suggest there is a link between this and a large increase in assessed mortality in recent years. However, when there has been serious side effects that, that occur, it is right that individuals and families have access to the vaccine damage payments. And I encourage anyone who has a side effect from any of the vaccines to use the yellow card system and report it to the, their GP. But it is wrong to consistently link the observed excess deaths to COVID-19 vaccines. And like the Honourable Member for Nolsey, I have concerns that this is stoke, not only stoking fear and misinformation, but doing this also distracts our public, public conversation away from other health concerns of critical importance. So while I disagree with honourable members on the... I would normally give way, but because of limited time, I really want to explain what the opposition is going... Our thoughts are. So while I disagree with honourable members on that specific issue, I'm pleased that we are discussing the topic today because, I have, as I've previously mentioned, we do face increasing assessed deaths and a wider health crisis across the country. The primary cause of assessed mortality has, of course, been a result of COVID-19. The pandemic was one of the most profound events of our lifetime. And here in the UK, hundreds of thousands of people died and millions were extremely ill. In fact, there are perhaps 2 million people still shielding because of their clinical vulnerability to their, their virus. And I'm sure, like me, we know who those in, some of those individuals are. The opposition has made the case over many years that the government and our health system was not fully prepared and was far too slow to act throughout the crisis. It is vital that we learn from lessons from the pandemic and take steps to strengthen our resilience for the future. This is also why it's so important the COVID-19 inquiry receives the support to needs to ensure mistakes are not repeated. As, as well as the pandemic, the government has named several other reasons for the increase in assessed deaths in recent years. These include high flu prevalence, a strep A outbreak, and Bina, increased... We have a point of order. I'm so sorry. It better be a point Mr. of order. Gary, your chairmanship is superb. Will you confirm that it's normal in these debates for the opposition spokesperson to have up to 10 minutes mm -hmm. to make their case, and therefore she has just under five minutes left, which is plenty of time for interventions. It's entirely a matter for the opposition spokesman, but thank you for the point of order. Abina. Thank you. An increase in conditions such as heart disease, diabetes and cancer. The government has said it's attempting, as, and this has been mentioned by a number of members in this debate, the government has said it's attempting to reduce assessed deaths with more health checks for its major condition strategy. We in the opposition welcome all effect, of efforts to improve the health of our country and tackle these issues. However, the reality is we must have a government that will build an NHS and a healthcare system that is there for the public when they need it. Unfortunately, I'm afraid I really want to explain what our concerns are and what we'll do as opposition. Unfortunately, after 14 years of conservative mismanagement, the country has seen the government do exactly the opposite. So for when it comes to patients being seen on time, the situation continues to get worse, with so many key NHS targets being missed. The Prime Minister promised last year to get NHS waiting lists down by 2024, yet this month we see that waiting lists remain sky high at 7.6 million, 400,000 higher than his promise. One year on, we have another pledge missed by the Prime Minister and this government, leaving so many families waiting for urgent care across the country. What's more, we are so far behind on critical health challenges. And as mentioned by the Honourable Member for Easington, on cancer mortality, thousands are needlessly dying because of slow and late diagnosis combined with delays to urgently need a treatment. Cancer waiting times are being consistently missed and some of them have not been met for over a decade at its leading cause of avoidable deaths in England. It is urgent we swiftly tackle this crisis 
That's why Labour have committed to improve cancer survival rates by hitting all NHS cancer waiting times and early diagnosis within five years so no, pat no patient waits longer than they should. The reality is, when it comes to NHS and the health of our nation, Labour offers a different plan. We are fully committed on delivering a mission driven government that will cut NHS waiting times and rebuild our NHS so it's there for the people when they need it. This includes measures like delivering two million more appointments and operations a year at evenings and weekends. It means doubling the number of scanners so patients with conditions like cancers not the Honourable Lady, in case she's not giving way, let, let, let's hear the and end of this speech. Thank you. ensuring ambulances get to people in time to save lives and not when it's too late. We will also tackle the wider health inequalities that currently mean life expectancy is much more worse in our country's poorest regions, with our focus on intervention and our shift to community care. And just last week, we announced our detailed child health action plan to reverse the plummeting health outcomes for our children through specific measures targeting waiting lists, mental health, dentistry, and more. We will ensure the generation is the healthiest generation of children ever. And this has been something that has been echoed as an area of concern by a number of members in this debate. I want to conclude by restating the opposition's concerns about increasing SS deaths in recent years. The COVID-19 was the most significant public threat our country has faced in over 100 years. It is vital that we can all learn the lessons from this profound event and make sure that mistakes like this never happen again. It is also critical we understand other trends in assessed mortality seen across the country and that we build our NHS and a healthcare system that invests in prevention because that is the key and that is there for the public when it is needed. I look forward to hearing from the Minister on all on these issues that have been mentioned by members and how we can tackle rising levels of assessed deaths across the country. Thank, Thank you, you, very you much. sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Minister, to respond, Maria Caulfield. Thank you, Sir Gary. It's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship. And can I thank the Honourable Member for North West Leicestershire for securing uh, this debate? It's an important debate. We've had a number of debates. I, I responded uh, to him very briefly uh, in October on his adjournment debate and acknowledging that he's absolutely correct. There is a, an increase in excess deaths, and we take that uh, very seriously. Uh, I take that seriously as a minister, but also uh, from my clinical background as well. And just to echo uh, the thoughts of many honourable members uh, this morning around uh, lessons uh, to be learnt uh, from the COVID period, I too, as the Minister for Pandemic Preparedness, would like some uh, uh, answers and advice for any future pandemics around the uh, impacts of lockdowns, face masks, timings of vaccine <coughs> rollouts. And um, while it is an independent inquiry, the focus on those issues would be extremely helpful to me as a minister. I will, not for, for the moment, let me just answer as many uh, points as I can uh, from honourable members. Because there are a, a number of uh, uh, increase in excess deaths, but there's a number of factors contributing to that. We do take it seriously and we are monitoring it constantly. If we look at the last year, for example, there's been a high flu pre prevalence last winter. There were still ongoing uh, challenges of incidents of COVID-19. There was a strep A outbreak, particularly uh, in children. And so we know that they have had an impact. And the uh, statistics from the Office for Health Improvement and Disparity showed that last year there were almost 26,400 excess deaths in England. And of those, 7,300 were due to acute respiratory infections, including flu and pneumonia. Last winter, the number of positive tests for flu peaked at 31.8%, the highest figure in the last six years. And there's schools of thoughts on that, in fact, that the people were were locked down, they weren't exposed to flu for a couple of years, and so their immune systems struggled to cope. That is why this year we have learnt those lessons 
and we brought forward our flu vaccination programme. We've successfully vaccinated over 17.6 million people uh, since uh, the campaign started in September. And we are seeing this winter, touch wood, Mr. Uh, Sir Gary, uh, it's still early in the winter season, but we are seeing less admissions from flu and COVID than we did last year. So we are learning the lessons from those excess uh, deaths. It is also the case that uh, there are excess deaths from cardiovascular disease, as been pointed out in the debate. The 6% higher than expected in, in England, with almost 13,500 uh, um, excess deaths um, uh, that were um, uh, attributed uh, to uh, cardiovascular disease. There is an impact of, of uh, lockdown on that. We know that people weren't getting their cholesterol tested, their blood pressure checked, uh, were still uh, smoking. There weren't the antihypertensives being prescribed, the statins. Uh, the blood pressure checks and again we have taken action as the honourable member for South West Bedfordshire pointed out we're supporting local authorities to resume our normal NHS health care checks um, um, between April and June uh, in the last year we've seen the highest number of checks been offered since the program began in 2013 we're investing 17 million pounds in innovative new dig digital health checks to be rolled out this spring which will deliver an additional 1 million checks in the first four years We've got a 10 million pilot to deliver up to 150,000 cardiovascular disease checks in the workplace, with free blood pressure checks being rolled out to, uh, to, in over 40 uh, community to people over 40 in community pharmacies, and we're investing 645 million uh, pounds to include blood pressure checks again in our community pharmacy uh, facilities. And that's in addition to the work the Prime Minister is doing, uh, which he announced around smoke-free uh, generations, uh, which will be debated further, but which we want to see uh, rates of smoking reduce further. But I will turn to the elephant in the room around uh, the COVID vaccine, because I know uh, the Honourable Gentleman has raised his concerns, as have other Honourable Members, about safety around uh, COVID vaccines. It is true that from the Office of Nas National Statistics, uh, which was published only in August, that it shows that people who have had a COVID-19 vaccine have a lower mortality rate than those that haven't uh, been vaccinated. And just to the point the Honourable Member for Bosworth made uh, in an intervention, it is true to say, and the Honourable uh, Gentleman from uh, North East, West Leicestershire is absolutely correct, uh, that there is a high uh, number of people who've uh, been vaccinated who appear in the excess death uh, population. But when 93.6% of the population have had at least one dose of uh, COVID vaccine, there will be a high rate of vaccination in the excess death numbers. But that is prevalence, that is not causality. And it's important in this debate that we do look at the causes of excess death and tackle them. Uh, I will give way uh, just briefly. Caroline Johnson. Lady is saying that the minister is saying that the number of people dying who are vaccinated is lower, sorry, is higher than the people who are not, and that that's to be expected because they are more likely to be older and frailer. Does she have any data which adjusts for age and frailty to say whether the vaccinated population are more or less likely to die? Um, uh, I don't have those figures on me, but I'm very happy to write with her uh, with that information. But I'm not saying that there's a, a higher rate if people are vaccinated. I'm saying there's a high number of people appearing in the excess death uh, uh, figures because 93.6% of the population were indeed vaccinated. That does not uh, link to causality. Um, it shows a high prevalence um, uh, instead. And just to reiterate, no vaccine. Um, uh, I'll just give away one more time. Thank the Minister for giving way. And just on that very point, should during the public inquiry there not been a greater uh, 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 importance upon uh, investigating the excess deaths as opposed to keeping it and delaying that part of the inquiry? Well, uh, you know, the public inquiry is independent and the government is under heavy scrutiny from uh, the inquiry. So it's not for me to say uh, how they should uh, conduct the inquiry. Um, but we, as a government, are, are looking at uh, the causes of excess deaths and where we can uh, uh, introduce um, urgent measures to reverse that as quickly as possible, we're doing so. But just on the COVID vaccine uh, point, 
No medicine or vaccine, even the simple paracetamol, is, uh, is completely risk-free. And so we do have systems in place continually monitoring uh, the safety of our medicines. And just to highlight uh, one of the, the, the measures that we did make when reports, either through the yellow card system, through GPs, through clinicians, uh, raised about the AZ vaccine, um, just to say, can I just make this point, that in April 2021, uh, the MHRA reacted to rare cases of concurrent thrombosis and thrombocytopenia following the AZ vaccine, which resulted in action that adults under 30 were not being offered uh, the vaccine any further. And in May of that year, this was increased to adults under 40. Um, so where there is concern, we will take action and take recommendations from all, uh, bodies like the MHRA to make sure that those uh, vaccines are as safe as, as they can be. I will give way. I thank the Minister for giving way. Uh, it's really important, and she knows as well as I do, the yellow card scheme sits at the heart of safe clinical care. Um, but there's allegations uh, circulating that the MHRA is sitting on yellow cards related to the COVID-19 vaccine that are 50 times greater than any other <laughs> vaccine that's been reported into them. Uh, will she commit to uh, asking the MHRA to account for this and to take urgent action if indeed they are sitting on the yellow card system reports? Okay, thank you. So Gary has reminded me we've got two minutes left. I will absolutely take that his point. You know, if people have got concerns, I'm more than happy to raise them with organisations or to, to answer uh, to honourable and right honourable members. But just to highlight that uh, if you look at the vaccine damage payment scheme, while we had over uh, 4,000, uh, 8,000 uh, claims so far, 4,000 of those have been rejected either because of causality or because of um, uh, the impact of the severity. 159 have been awarded. 156 of those are for the AZ vaccine, two for Pfizer, one for Moderna. So as well as the information that the MHRA co are collecting, we're analysing the vaccine damage payment scheme as well to keep <coughs> constantly reviewing the safety of, our, uh, of the vaccines there. But can I just make one point? I can't remember which honourable member said it. We must be careful in the language we use. We have a measles outbreak at the moment in this country affecting young children, particularly high outbreaks in London and the West Midlands. Now, thankfully, it's mild in most cases, but children can die. They can have long-term uh, side effects. And there is a danger that if we are uh, not careful with the language used, absolutely scrutinise uh, the safety. But we do need to make sure that we are not deterring uh, parents from coming forward and we're seeing outbreaks, that we, we nearly eradicated measles um, uh, and we're seeing outbreaks because of uh, concerns about um, uh, vaccinations. And we all have a duty to make sure that we, uh, while we have concerns, that we also have responsibilities as well. So just to touch on one, uh, two minutes left, uh, one uh, quick point. If there are um, uh, clinicians and experts who've got concerns, just to point them to the funding that we have available for the Nas National Institute for Health and Care Research. It's £110 million allocated for COVID-19 vaccine research. I would encourage them to make use of that fund uh, to develop our knowledge further. And just to reassure uh, Sir Gary, colleagues that absolutely acknowledge that there is uh, a risk in excess deaths, um, that uh, we are working towards how we reduce that as quickly as possible, uh, and the effects of lockdown have had a, a, a negative effect in many cases. We're also mindful of the safety of vaccinations, and we have taken action when safety concerns have been raised. And just a final point to the Honourable Member for Watford around coronial de delays. It's a matter for the Ministry of Justice, but if he wants to write to me with the details of his case, I'm very happy to take it up with the Ministry of Justice. So to thank the Honourable Member for bringing this case, my door is open and um, I'm very happy to uh, continue a discussion with him on this issue. Thank you very much. Andrew Bridgen will have the final say. Andrew. As it always should be, Sir Gary. It's been excellent, your chairmanship uh, of this debate. I have been extremely impressed with the turnout, which is far in excess of my expectations. I'd like to congratulate all right and right honourable members who've attended, especially those who've made these contributions to the debate. And I'd like to thank the uh, Shadow Minister and the, the Minister for their participation. Um, respectfully, I would advise the, uh, the front bench spokespeople that uh, not taking interventions does not fill colleagues with confidence and it won't fill the wider public with confidence either on these matters that, that the spokespeople are being open and transparent. And if we want to reassure the people, they need to have confidence in us moving forward. 
Clearly, time has been of uh, short supply. Three minutes for backbench contributions was insufficient. And I do hope that all those present here in this chamber today and others who haven't been able to attend but wanted to speak would support an immediate call for a three-hour debate in the main chamber. Um, that, I think, would treat the whole issue of um, excess, trends in excess deaths with uh, the reverence and the time and respect that our constituents demand and that we need to make uh, those contributions and get to the absolute truth. Because I'm sad, saddened that I do not believe this trend in excess death is going to stop any time soon. In fact, I think it's going to continue and the concern from our constituents is only going to escalate. The, the Minister talked about the, uh, the elephant in the room, the, uh, the, the vaccine harms. It's, it's that bad, um, and it's going to get that bad, that even the elephant in the room has died suddenly, apparently. <laughs> the, the minister could, could sort all this out uh, if, uh, if her department, if you were to tell those data holders to release the record level data, the vaccine uh, records, the date of vaccination, uh, the age of the vaccinated, what they were vaccinated with, and whether they've died or not or had a severe adverse event. That level of data would sort out this argument once and for all. And if Order. The, if Order. Colleagues, we must move on to the next debate. Thank you, all those who attended. Please leave quietly and in good order. And thank you for your contributions. Thank you, Minister. Gosh, oh.